John's talks, it's always an honor to be at John's talks because they are gold filled. His talks are the type of thing you want to go back and listen to. John catches the nuances that you're feeling and actually translates them into words so that you understand why what you're feeling seems wrong is wrong. <laughs> so I encourage you to listen to his talk again um, once it's available because it's loaded. It, it was phenomenal. And he always comes up with these little Jesse Jackson-esque, in, in a good way, um, you know, these comments like, their cause is not brought under the kingship of Christ. Rather, their cause is their king. Yeah. Things like apathetic inaction versus immoral action justifies wrong action, the pietist, justifies um, inaction, the pragmatist justifies wrong action. It's like Jesse Jackson-esque <laughs> type stuff in a good way. You know what I mean? So anyways, I, like, I always like being at John's talks. My wife Clara sends her greetings oh, to all of you and is sorry that she's not able to be here. Russell has asked me to talk about the role of the people regarding the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the role of the people. And your role is huge. It's really, really massively big in regards to the doctrine. I do have a little short PowerPoint to go through some of this stuff. I won't look at John Michener um, while I'm doing this because he's really good at PowerPoints. And mine suck. <laughs> so John Michener is going to come up. We're coming out here and working our way in. So I'm going broad with the role of the people. And then John's going to come up and finish things um, with what exactly is going on here. So hopefully this will, be, this will be good. The title of my little lecture here is The Historic Role of the People in Affecting Government Officials the historic role of the people in affecting government officials. Okay, I want to begin with a story about the state that I come from, Wisconsin. And it begins with this guy up here. It's March 10th, 1854 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And this man, Sherman Booth, is riding up and down the streets of Milwaukee where I'm from. And he's saying, a man's liberty is at stake. Rally at the courthouse at 2 p.m. And lo and behold, 5,000 people show up. He was stunned even by how many came. The reason they were rallying is because a slave named Joshua Glover, that's a picture of him there, had been arrested and beaten bloody by federal marshals down in Racine, which is about 20 miles south of Milwaukee. And... He had been brought by the federal marshals to the county jail in Milwaukee County, in Milwaukee, where the city was there. So they gathered together to speak out against the injustice that this runaway slave was experiencing and to rally people to take action on his behalf. About five in the evening, a hundred men from Racine showed up with the sheriff from Racine. And the sheriff from Racine had an arrest warrant for the federal marshals. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> so, so this wasn't an average day in Milwaukee. <laughs> well, the federal marshals were unimpressed with the arrest warrant. So the people said, give us the keys. We're letting the, we're letting the slave out. They said, no, you're not letting the slave out. So 20 big guys grabbed a big piece of timber and literally smashed the jail door to the ground. And the people went in and brought Joshua Glover out and put him on the back of a wagon, still with dried blood all over his head. And Joshua Glover exclaimed just two words while he stood on the back end of that wagon. Glory, hallelujah. 
Well, lo and behold, there was a faint-hearted anti-slavery Democrat in the area named John Messenger. And he said, put the slave on my carriage. And he, with the federal posse in tow, took him all the way to Waukesha, Wisconsin. From there, he was put in a farmhouse and was on the Underground Railroad for the next two weeks. Finally made it back to the port of Racine, got on a boat, and made it to Canada and was free. Amen. And he didn't die till 20 some years later, old age, between the ages of 84 and 88. Now, the reason this story is important is because, because of what those people did that day, our magistrates in the state of Wisconsin stood in interposition against federal tyranny. This happened in March of 1854, and on July 19, 1854, our state Supreme Court declared the Federal Fugitive Slave Act to be null, void, and without authority, and of no force. Our legislature, on March 19, 1859, because this went on for a long time, a million little stories I could tell you about what went on here. And by the way, most Wisconsinites, most Milwaukeeans know nothing about this. It's stunning. We did a tour last year based on this story, calling upon our legislature, our governor, our attorney general to interpose for the pre-born. Nobody knew what we were talking about. Staring with blank looks. What do you mean? You can't, the Supreme Court? You can't defy the Supreme Our Supreme Court and the state legislature both defied the Supreme Court. I stood on a corner with about 12 policemen. None of them had heard about this story. Next to a mural that was as wide as the freeway. We're under the freeway. The mural, this is a busy road, has nothing but the story of Joshua Glover. These were all black Americans, police officers. They stood speechless and listened to me about, tell stories about this for 20 minutes. And they all said, we need to look into this. <laughs> Our Wisconsin legislature on March 19th, in interposition of Sherman Booth, because see, since the slave got away, the feds still wanted to get somebody. So they went after Sherman Booth to get him under the Federal Fugitive Slave Act. And our state legislature stood in interposition for him, as did our Supreme Court. And they declared on March 19th, these very words, resolved that this assumption of jurisdiction by the federal judiciary, talking about the Supreme Court, in the said case and without process, is an act of undelegated power and therefore without authority, void, and of no force. It took them years to capture him. Once there was actually a showdown where they wanted to arrest him and people got into a scuffle with federal marshals so that Sherman Booth could escape. Many, many stories I could tell. My point is simply, all this happened. Our Supreme Court interposing, our legislature interposing, all of it happened for only one reason, because of the people. Because they did something on behalf of their neighbor in need. Because they took action on behalf of those who were being oppressed, as Scripture calls upon us to do. Now change countries, change centuries too. So move up to December 15, 1989, we're in Timisoara, Romania, yeah. where Reformed Minister Pastor Laszlo Tokes is under threat of arrest by the Securitate, the secret police of Romania. His congregants know that they're coming to take their pastor away, so they begin to camp out outside his home. And when they show up, they actually interpose between the secret police and their pastor and say, you're not taking him. This created a huge stir where literally hundreds and thousands of more people began to show up. These fearless Christians were the first to interpose. Over 20 years now, Ceausescu had a reign of terror going on through Romania. And it took this simple act of love for their pastor by these Christians to spark a revolution in the nation of Romania, 
wherein two weeks later, Ceausescu and his wife were dead on the palace steps. First, there were hundreds around his house, and within 48 hours, there were thousands around the pastor's house. And then this spread to a nationwide revolution around the country. You know, when you see a picture like that, you think to yourself, why doesn't this ever happen in my neighborhood? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we seem to be stuck with apathy and indifference, you know? Even the military joined in once the people began to take action. Uh, one general, Ville Massilia, he was actually ordered to shoot the protesters by Ceausescu, and he refused. And he was later killed before Ceausescu fell for his actions. He interposed and refused to go along with the higher authority and the evil they intended to do. Again, my point of this is, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for the actions of the people. None of this would have taken place. Your role is huge. Amen. When it comes to the interposition of lesser magistrates, against the evil actions of a tyrannical higher authority. So don't ever underestimate how important your role is. You prod your government officials to do right, to do what is needed and necessary to interpose against unjust and immoral actions by the superior governing authority. Remember the story of Saul and Jonathan? Saul gives the foolish edict, nobody shall eat anything. Jonathan didn't hear. He goes ahead and eats some honey. Saul was going to kill his own son, but the scriptures say the people interposed on his behalf. Yeah, they, they rescued Jonathan, it says, and said not one hair shall touch his head. That story is found in 1 Samuel 14, if you're taking notes. What does it mean to prod? Because that's your first great duty regarding your role. Prod. Prod the magistrates to do what is needed and necessary. Prod means to poke someone with a finger, foot, or pointed object. <laughs> a pointed implement, typically one discharging an electric current and used as a goad. Yeah. Oh. That's an electric prod, you know, you use on cattle. Some of them are like cattle. They've been bought off by the special interests. They need to be prodded with an electric goad. Okay, and we're all old enough here to understand, you know, abstract thought, right? <laughs> so, that's all I need is someone going in with one of those tomorrow. <laughs> Merriam-Webster says, prod means to poke or stir, to push someone or something to persuade or try to persuade someone to do something. Webster in 1828, there was no word called prod then, at least not in his dictionary. But the synonym that applies is the word press. Press. And he, Webster defined the word press as, quote, to urge with force or weight a word of extensive use denoting the application of any power, physical or moral, to something that is to be moved or affected, to constrain, to compel, to urge by authority or necessity. This is what you have to do. You have to prod them for total abolition of abortion. Immediate interposition, total abolition, except nothing less. Right. If you want to know how to do that, Watch the little eight-minute video that Russell put up the other day. It's gold. It's gold. This is what you must do regarding the magistrates. Your first great role and duty is to prod the magistrates. You know, my son-in-law, Jason, who a lot of you know, I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him since I got here. But you know, him and 13 other people, including my daughter, went to San Francisco and interposed when the homosexuals were being married by Gavin Newsom, who was the mayor of San Francisco. There were literally hundreds of them flying in from around the country. They had a, you know, they had a line around the block 
down the halls of City Hall into where it was. We're back in Milwaukee, us old people, you know, having a prayer meeting. And after we were done, somebody brings up, you just see what's going on in San Francisco? What should we do about that? And somebody wanted to make a sign. And we're like, That's, some of you always want to make a sign. You know what I mean? <laughs> Signs are good, but sometimes you got to do something besides make a sign, okay? Yeah. And um, so anyways, from our little talk after the prayer meeting, we called Jason right from there, got him on the speakerphone, and said, Jason, did you see what's going on in San Francisco? They're seven miles south in Southern California. San Francisco is Northern California. We said, you got to do something. Get some people to get up together. Go up there and, and just interpose at the door where they're all going in to be married. Because I said, that's when Schwarzenegger will finally say something. Because remember Arnold? He was the governor at the time. This is a long time ago. Some of you are probably still little. So Governor Schwarzenegger was all for homosexual marriage once it was, you know, being talked about openly. But he hadn't said anything up to this point. He was just letting this go on for a week. As soon as they interposed at the door, he was in front of the microphones the next day saying, we're shutting this down because now we're going to have conflict between these two sides. That's all it took was 13 young people interposing at the door. They sat down, walked past all of them, sat down in the entrance, and sang hymns to the Lord. I turned on ABC National News that night, and there's my son-in-law and, and daughter, top story. Come on. These are important things to do. Yes. When you take action, it prods the magistrates to do what's needed and necessary. Arnold Schwarzenegger would have never stopped it had he not been prodded to do so, if Christians hadn't taken action like they did. The second great role you have is to rally your magistrates once they do what is needed and necessary. You have to be willing to give of your lives, of your substance, of your prayers. You have to assure them of that, that you're not going to leave them hanging in the wind if they do what's needed and necessary, if they do interpose, you will be there, both publicly and privately. You will sacrifice, you'll give up your, we're from Milwaukee, fish fry on Friday night in order to rally with the magistrate. Amen. Those of you who are from Milwaukee know how big the fish fry on Saturday night is. That's about as exciting as it got up in Milwaukee. <laughs> Here's the story of Sheriff Nick Finch from Liberty County, Florida. In 2013, March of 2013, three years ago, a guy was arrested on a gun charge. He was put within his jail. Sheriff Finch, upon coming to work, saw it was in his jail, saw he was in on a gun charge, saw it was a violation of the Second Amendment, walked down, let him out of his cell, and set him free. Three months later, later, Attorneys from the district attorney's office and the attorney general's office came and arrested him, charged him with three counts of malfeasance in office. He was looking at years in prison, and the governor removed him from his job. You know what the people did? They rallied. They rallied by the thousands, and they gathered thousands of signatures. They held multiple public rallies, and their message was simple. Why are you attacking our sheriff when the only thing he did was protect our liberties. Amen? Amen? He was tried in October of 2013, and it took the jury only an hour to find him not guilty of all three charges. I saw him afterwards when he was uh, released. He wept. This was a strong man, but you have to understand, 20 years in law enforcement, they were taking away how he put food on his children's table. He was looking at years in prison, everything being wiped out. This is a great story of what happens when the magistrates do what need, is needed and necessary and the people do what their role and duty is and rally around a magistrate who does what's needed and necessary. Understand? Yes. This is like massively important stuff. Um, prodding the magistrates is not always so flamboyant as the examples I shared earlier, nor do they always turn out so well. And um, 
Let me make two quick points to you. Two things to remember. Numbers, you never need a majority. Don't worry about that. The vast majority of people only care about three things all their life. Me, myself, and I. A small minority committed to a holy cause can see great things done in the land. And that's a fact. Here's what um, Sam Adams said. He said, it does not require a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen to set brush fires in people's minds. And we could change that to, but rather a godly, bothered minority. Because we're bothered as Christian people when we see God's law being openly impugned. When we see Christ being spit upon by our magistrates. That should bother you if you're a Christian. So, the second thing I want you to understand is this. Most Christians today are not like the Jews that kept following Governor Petronius everywhere he went. Most Christians, you know that, right? John just got done with his talk on pietism. Most of them are not like those Jews. Christians are supposed to be a theologically driven people, and unfortunately, the pietists have taught American Christians to have a theologically driven aversion to have anything to do with politics or government matters. They teach them to believe they are not, they teach them to believe they are spiritual by not having anything to do with politics or government matters. You have to turn that upside down. This is your third great role as the people. One is prod, two is rally, three is school and instruct the Christians so that they see from a theological vantage point that yes, God's word does speak to all matters of life, including matters of civil government. Now, when you follow history on pietism and why it grew, wealthy men are behind it. They had a vested interest in seeing this form of Christianity, which was taken out of the public square and put over here in the corner. They wanted that form of Christianity to become prevalent. It's precisely what scholar and historian Stephen Osmond pointed out about the difference between the reformers of the Reformation and the Christians of today. He stated, listen to me now, Reform that existed only in pamphlets and sermons and not also in law and institutions would remain a private affair, confined to all intents and purposes within the minds of preachers and pamphleteers. That's what pietism has done. We have to show them from Scripture. I'm talking about our brothers and sisters, the Christians who are steeped in their pietism, we have to show them from Scripture that they are wrong. This takes patience. Now, I did a little talk where I went through a bunch of their slogans, because you have to dismantle their slogans. They're big on slogans. They're not big on being scholars of the Word. They got all these little slogans that are told over and over again. Like one of them I share is, just preach the gospel. You say something about helping the preborn, they say, well, we should just preach the gospel. And I respond by saying, first off, nobody just preaches the gospel. Do you ever take your kids for a walk? Do you ever spend time with your wife? Do you ever use the toilet? You know, <laughs> nobody just preaches the gospel. <laughs> and did you ever notice when they bring up, we should just preach the gospel? You know, when you're sitting there in the next potluck, dinner's being announced, no one leaps up and says, wait a minute. We should just preach the gospel. Or when the next church softball team is being organized, no one leaps up, wait a minute. Wait, we should just. It's only when you bring up something like helping your preborn neighbor or defending God's definition of marriage or some involvement in some good governance that they leap up and say, we should just preach the gospel. I dealt with other ones. I just expect sinners to act. We should just pray. God doesn't call the church to address the symptoms of sin. Here's one other one I want to address. We cannot look to politics as a savior. There is no political savior. You bring up your interest in seeing good governance in the land. 
Oh, brother, they're concerned about you. That you actually are going to make politics your savior. Okay? Now, that's what the humanist does. Because that's all the humanist has, is his politics and the state. That's all he's got. But Christians, we view things a little differently. We read Romans 13, 1, and we see that God established the institution of civil government. We read Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, and we see that this God-ordained institution called civil government has specific functions and roles to fulfill in the earth. So when we see civil government perverting their God-given function and role, it bothers us. And we feel duty-bound to do something about it, to speak out against it, to take action against it, because they have perverted their God-given role and they're spitting in the face of Christ. Now, the pietists have been busy teaching everybody not to be bothered. Any upstart Christian who comes along through their ranks and wants to get involved in anything like that, they dump all these slogans on him to get him back on the bus. In the book of Psalms, it says that justice is the foundation of his throne. Okay, the foundation of his throne is justice. In the book of Isaiah, it says that justice inhabits his very being. I'm talking about God's being. And when you read scripture, you read the prophets, you see repeatedly that injustice and immorality bother the Lord. And by extension, as his people, therefore injustice and immorality should bother us. Um, so you need to go to the state house. They need to see you. They must hear from you. Listen to me now. The magistrates need to be schooled in good governance. Amen. When you read the Apologists of Old, 150 to 300 AD, they always address the magistrates and then the people in their writings because they understood that Christ's kingdom impacts nations. It impacts individuals, but it also impacts nations. And they understood that. Pastor Laszlo Tokas, who I encourage you to read his book, The Fall of Tyrants, very important, about what happened in Romania. He's the reform minister. He understood that God's word speaks to all matters of life, including the matters of civil government. He writes about the young people he was ministering to in Romania, and he says, listen, quote, we taught them that there is no part of the Christian life that is inadmissible to God, where the claims of God's truth and his justice do not rightfully reign. The work with the young people grew out of that conviction that Christianity and the culture of one's nation cannot be separated, not by means of some crazy nationalism, but desiring to see the city of God. Christ impacts nations. He went on to say, the Bible says, that when you become a Christian, your mind is renewed, and so with that renewing of your mind comes a new view of the world in which you live. I saw no conflict at all, therefore, between my position as a pastor and my involvement with cultural matters. He goes on to say in debt, spelled D-E-J, I don't know how they pronounce it, city there in Romania, in debt, communism and its atheistic creed dominated the life of the community. A cleric bringing faith and religious perspectives into the common life, everyday life, was intolerable to the authorities, unquote. This is what brought him on the radar screen of the communist authorities, was that he believed that God's word spoke to every area of life yeah. and, and has application in every area of life. Now, you could take that last statement where he says in death, communism and its atheistic creed dominated the life of the community and just change it to secular. In death, or in America, secularism and its atheistic creed dominates the life of the community. A minister bringing faith and religious perspectives into the common life is intolerable to them. That's what you're doing. 
That's why you're hated both by the pagan and the pietist. The pagan hates you because they despise Christ's rule. The pietist hates you because of their messed up religion. Now here's a book to read. And the reason it's good to read is for a number of reasons. One is it helps you see how there's nothing new under the sun. It shows so much about human nature. It's called the Tyrannicide Brief. And it's about the Puritans. The book is about John Cook, who was the prosecutor at Charles I's trial. He's not a Christian. That comes through clear. But his immense respect for the Puritans comes out loud and clear throughout his writings. And he says this, the author of this book, challenging the absolutist claim of royal power would require a different breed of men with a faith firm enough to transcend trivial temptations of earthly wealth and privilege. Okay? He's talking about how everybody was on the take. Sound vaguely familiar to America? So... Just change the words from challenging the absolutist claim of royal power to challenging the absolutist claim of federal power will require a different breed of men with a faith firm enough to transcend trivial temptations of earthly wealth and privilege. That's what it's going to take. One of those men was John Eliot. He was a knight, and he died in the Tower of London from consumption. He and eight other MPs defied King Charles I. He had him arrested, and only he and three others stood firm and refused to apologize to the king. Historians credit what these men did with the revolution that began 12 years later in England because of their inner position as lesser magistrates and their willingness to suffer these are the types of men that are needed, those who exhibit bravery and sacrifice, and that's the type of people that are needed. Those of you willing to show bravery and have a willingness to sacrifice, this is hugely important. These two nefarious characters here, that's Thomas Wentworth on the left and Edward Hyde on the right, they started out with the good guys. But because of wealth, position, prestige, they abandoned it all and went with Charles. Those types of guys are always around. And that's why I encourage you to read the book. I couldn't put it down. There's not many books like that that Matuella reads. This was one of them. It's phenomenal. So much about human nature. Everything you encounter, good godly men have encountered before you. They berated Sir Elliot for not just, apology, just an apology. He refused to do it because he knew it wasn't sincere. When we used to interpose at the doors of the abortion clinic and get thrown in jail, the Christians would tell us that we were bad Christians because we weren't at home taking care of our wives and our children. And we didn't go to church on Sunday. Yeah, and we didn't go to church on Sunday. There will always be those who will want you to conform. This message of yours, abolition, is so needed. Don't ever stop. Don't ever give in. Don't ever become a Wentworth or a Hyde. Don't do it. Remain true to Christ. You have to demand, I love that little two-minute video that you guys made, because at the end it says we must demand total abolition. And that's exactly what Frederick Douglass said also, that it has to be demanded. And he's exactly right. The type of men that were, are needed in this day can be summed up by the words of Leonard Ravenhill, he said this, he said, the preacher may go 
with the crowd. By the way, all you women in here, you need to read the story about Anne Askew. I always do this with my sons and daughters. I give them those who love Christ who are willing to suffer. Because there were many good males and many good females who did so. Anne Askew is a story worth reading about. But here's what Ravenhill said. The preacher may go with the crowd. The prophet goes against it. A man freed, fired, and filled with God will be branded unpatriotic because he speaks against his nation's sins, unkind because his tongue is a two-edged sword, unbalanced because the weight of preaching opinion is against him. Preachers make pulpits famous. Prophets make prisons famous. The preacher will be heralded, the prophet hounded. We love the old saints, missionaries, martyrs, reformers, our Luthers, Bunyans, Wesleys, Asburys. We will write their biographies, reverence their memories, frame their epitaphs, and build their monuments. We will do anything except imitate them. We cherish the last drop of their blood, but watch carefully the first drop of our own. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, how many of you know of him? Just a few, and you're older. I want the young, you're pretty young. Young people, there was this guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn in prison in communist Soviet Union in Russia for years. They finally let him go because of pressure from the West. He came here in the 1970s. He was known because of his writings, his dissident writings. And when the press surrounded him, when he got off the plane, they said, what happened in Russia? And he responded by saying, we forgot God. And all the press hated him for that, that he dare bring up God. And they shunned him after that. He wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago to talk about the sufferings of the people there. However you pronounce that word. Close enough, enough, good. (laughs) But in there, he talks about, if you've ever been to Russia, they have these massive apartment buildings. And he said... The secret police would pull up and everybody would hide behind their doors, just hoping it wasn't them. And eventually they would pick out who they were taking away and everybody would sigh relief, even though they knew they would never see their neighbor again. And he said, why did we do that? Why didn't we just kill them? That's what he said, and bury them out back. Why did, there were hundreds of us, thousands of us, And we conformed. And he said the reason is because every man always has handy a dozen glib little reasons why he is right not to sacrifice himself. And that's how we are as people. So anyways, I went over my time already. Remember, prod, rally, school. Thank you.